Hi everyone, so we're going to review eternalism and nihilism just to make sure we're very clear about the two extremes. So remember that nihilism is also called annihilation or the extreme of annihilation. Eternalism is also sometimes called the extreme of permanence and is not the same thing as our general discussion of permanence. So these two extremes come from our ignorance, the ignorance that grasps at inherent existence. So we're going to go back through them and just make sure they're clear. And then we're going to discuss a little bit more about what is a valid basis and how does mere labeling occur and that subtlest level of dependent arising. So here we go. So one more time, the extreme of permanence refers to eternalism from the dictionary, not from the Buddhist perspective, but it's similar. Eternalize, the verb, means cause to last forever or perpetuate. Eternalism, the noun, can be one, excessive regard for outward form in religion. The example is religion needs to be questioned for its negative attitudes, hypocrisy, and eternalism. Two, philosophy, the view that mental events and acts are essentially dependent on the world external to the mind. In opposition to the Cartesian related to Descartes and his ideas, separation of mental and physical worlds. So the extreme of permanence is like this. The extreme of annihilation or nihilism. Annihilation from the English dictionary is complete destruction or obliteration, total defeat or destruction. C, to annihilate. Nihilism um, brings more nuance to that meaning. The rejection of all principles, the belief that life is meaningless. In philosophy, it refers to extreme skepticism, maintaining that nothing in the world has real existence. And so continuing on with the text, the idea that things arise negates the other extreme view, nihilism. We spoke about this on Monday. This wrong view maintains that because something is empty of inherent existence, it is therefore completely non-existent. That's what nihilism is. This is not true, because even though something is empty of inherent existence, it still arises in dependence on causes and conditions, parts, and being merely labeled by the mind. Things arise and they do exist. How do they exist? They exist in dependence on these three factors, which negates the idea that they are completely non-existent. In this way, these two concepts within the term dependent, arising, negate permanence and complete non-existence. And for this reason, dependent arising is the highest proof of emptiness, the final arbiter that destroys both extreme views. Let us understand why these lower Buddhist schools believe that dependent arising means that things inherently exist. They believe that things come about through causes and conditions, but they conclude that therefore they must inherently exist. They argue that if you investigate something that arises through causes and conditions, you can find it to exist from its own side. That if you look hard enough, you can find the inherently existent thing. And so our job as middle way consequentialists or people aspiring to be middle way consequentialists is to negate these lower tenant schools. They further claim that it is only because there is this inherently existent substance or part that things can come about through causes and conditions at all. They hold that there must be inherently existent causes and conditions to lead to the inherently existent result. 
that is how they explain things to exist. In the same way, they do not believe that things only exist through being merely labeled by the mind. They argue that for things to be merely labeled by the mind, there has to be something inherently existent on which to label. Therefore, they assert that things and events come into existence through the meeting of the imputation or labeling by the mind and the inherently existent thing. In this way, they argue that things arising in dependence upon causes and conditions, relying on the parts in the whole, and on being merely labeled by the mind, proves that they inherently exist. So by calling it a lower tenant school, we know that the highest form of Buddhism is negating that and saying that's not true. But this view is very much how we actually think. We agree there's a little bit of projection. Okay, we project, but surely there's something inherent, something self-existent from the side of the basis, even if mostly we're projecting. So it's good to understand that lower tenant schools adhere to that kind of worldly understanding. And it's still one of the Buddhist schools. It's not like a non-Buddhist school. It is a Buddhist school to believe that. But there's something even more subtle that we can do. So it's useful to understand that all of these Buddhist tenant schools, we can see kind of reflections of them in Western philosophy, in different forms of Eastern philosophy, but even echoes of them in psychology in various forms. We understand about projection, but we still sort of think that there is something that we are projecting onto that has some sort of core solidness. So. If you want to think, and His Holiness says a good place to start can be, imagine that everything that appears to you is 90% your projection, and acknowledge that 10% maybe comes from the side of the basis. Even though the middle way consequence school goes even more deeply, just walking around, not kind of feeling too unsettled, you can think, okay, 90%'s my projection, 10% is coming from the side of the basis. And that's a really good way to kind of live in the world and still be moving in the right direction. So that's enough for the two extremes. Let's look a little bit more deeply, though, at this subtlest view about things relying or depending upon mere designation in order to exist. And this is a really interesting point. So we're going to look at Lama Zopa Rinpoche's book and a little bit of a PowerPoint but really to think about what causes a label and what makes that label valid, what is a basis upon which we can label, and how is it we come to agreement about things anyway if there is no inherent existence. So, back to it. Virtue and Reality by Lama Zopa Rinpoche Awareness and the Self Page 46. Student. May I ask a question, please? You were speaking before about the illusory nature of the I. What's the difference between that itself and the awareness of it? Rinpoche. The awareness that recognizes things is mind. That awareness is not the I, the self. The mind is a part of the base. In this life, you have a body and a mind. This association of body and mind is the base that you label I. Body and mind are the base. I is the label. The base and the label are two different phenomena. Not only that, I is the possessor, mind that which is possessed. When you say, my mind, I is the possessor, and mind is the possession. They are subject and object, two different things, not one. Therefore, the awareness that recognizes things is not I. It is neither the real I, the I that appears to us not merely labeled by the mind, nor even the merely labeled I. But just because you cannot find the I on your aggregates 
From the tips of your hair down to your toes, the body is not I, the mind is not I, even the association of both is not I. The I cannot be found anywhere, does not mean that it does not exist. The I exists. The I, the self, cannot be found on your aggregates, the association of your body and mind. The real I that appears from there cannot be found. Even the merely labeled I cannot be found there. But that doesn't mean that the I does not exist in this room. It exists in this room, it exists in America, but it doesn't exist on your association of body and mind. As long as your body and mind are in this room, the I cannot be found on that base, but it exists in this room. But the only reason for saying that it exists in this room and is not at home right now is the association of your body and mind are in this room. That's the only reason. Even though you cannot find the eye on them. The minute your body and mind leave the room, so does the eye. It is no longer present in this room. So what is that eye? It is nothing other than that which has been merely imputed by the mind because of the existence of the base, the association of body and mind. By analyzing your eye in this way, you can come to see that it is totally something else, completely different from what you've always thought it was, from beginningless rebirths up to the present. All this time your mind has merely been labeling I on the association of body and mind, and that is how it exists. But every time your mind has merely labeled I, it doesn't appear back to you as if it's been merely labeled. That's the problem. If the I did always appear to you as merely labeled by the mind, it would be impossible for you to generate anger, jealousy, grasping, attachment, and all the other painful emotional minds. If you were able to perceive the I as merely labeled by the mind, there would be no base upon which delusions could arise. Then you wouldn't create motivating karma, suffering, or samsara itself. What happens is that after your mind merely labels I, when it appears back to you, it does not appear as if it had been merely labeled by the mind. It appears back in completely the opposite way, as if it had not been merely labeled by the mind. That is the hallucination. Therefore, the reality of the I that is merely labeled by the mind is that it is totally empty. It exists, but it is totally empty. It exists, but it is totally empty of existing from its own side. While it is empty of existing from its own side, the I exists. How? In mere name. When you realize this, you have gained an unmistaken realization of emptiness. On the single object, I, you are able to unify dependent arising and emptiness. The I itself is both empty, yet existent. It exists, but it is empty. When you realize these two, without division, you have gained an unmistaken realization of emptiness. If, in what you think is the realization of emptiness, you cannot unify these two, or find a contradiction with existence, then your so-called realization of emptiness is wrong. When it comes to this point, 
and you cannot define how the eye exists, you cannot see the existence of the eye. That means your realization of emptiness is not the actual realization of emptiness, but just ordinary emptiness. When you analyze, the eye becomes extremely subtle. So subtle that even though it is not non-existent, it is as if it were non-existent. It is not non-existent, but it seems to be non-existent. It appears not to exist. It becomes an unbelievably subtle phenomena. The line of demarcation between the existence and the non-existence of the eye is extremely fine, extremely subtle. So fine that what is existent appears to be almost non-existent. What it is, however, is merely labeled by the mind. What creates the labels? Before this section on what creates the labels, Lama Zopa Rinpoche explains a brief story as an example that ties in starts on page 65 and says, For example, Once in Tibet, there were a couple of monks who returned to their monastery after a long and tiring journey. To welcome them back, their teacher offered them cold tea. One of the disciples thought, How kind our teacher is. He knew we were hot and thirsty, so he intentionally gave us tea that was cold. The other thought, How mean and lazy. He couldn't even give us hot tea, and got upset and angry, so he destroyed himself. There was no benefit from the way he thought to either himself or his teacher. But by having a positive view, the first student made himself and his teacher happy. He made his mind peaceful, and since the tea had been offered by his guru, created much merit. The action, offering cold tea, was the same. What was different were the students' interpretations of that action. One labeled it as positive and was happy. The other labeled it as negative and created a problem for himself. So then going to the section on page 67. What creates the labels? Lama Zopa Rinpoche continues by saying, Before I finish, I'll make one more point. Like the monks in the story above, our minds are constantly making up labels that affect our lives. Depending on the label, we experience different feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And that's how our life goes, 24 hours a day. So what is it that causes our minds to create these different labels? People who apply positive labels experience happiness. People who apply negative labels experience suffering. What is it then that causes us to label things positive or negative? What's the force behind all this? It's karma. Because of past karma, some people are able to label things positively, while others have to label them negatively. The underlying cause is karma. Therefore, you can see how crucial it is to purify past negative karma and not to create any more. In other words, how essential it is to practice dharma. Only the practice of dharma can remove or prevent the negative karma that forces us to label things negatively, thereby creating our own suffering. Dharma is the solution to all life's problems, whatever they are, and more importantly, the sole means of preventing them from arising in the first place. By practicing Dharma now, we can avoid creating the causes for the heaviest sufferings of samsara, those of the lower realms, the hell, hungry ghost, and animal realms, and the sufferings we go through in the upper realms, even as humans. Illnesses such as cancer and AIDS, aging, death, everything, and thus avoid having to experience them. By practicing dharma now, we can purify the already created karma of such results. Here is where the whole answer to our problems lies. Purify the negative karma already created, 
do not create anymore. Review. Remember breaking the links in our 12 links discussion? Breaking the links between suffering and afflictions, between afflictions and karma, between karma and suffering. The summary of that being, we break the patterns between suffering and afflictions through practices like Tonglen, giving and taking. We break the pattern between afflictions and creating karma through practices like Lojong, thought transformation. And we break the patterns between karma turning into suffering again through practices like purification, four opponent powers in Vajrasattva being in the conventional side, the wisdom realizing emptiness on the ultimate side. Hence the discussion of tenets and levels of dependent arising. Continuing with the text. This is the reason we take precepts such as the refuge vow, the five lay precepts, not to mention the ordination vows taken by monks and nuns. You don't even have to take all five precepts. You can take one, two, three, or four, whatever you can manage. The five lay vows are to refrain from killing, refrain from stealing, refrain from lying, refrain from sexual misconduct, and refrain from taking intoxicants. Of course, there are countless negative karmas, but at least you can vow not to create certain kinds. By practicing Dharma today, we also create the causes for our own happiness. The happiness of this life, future lives, liberation, and enlightenment. This is something we can do right now. Therefore, it is essential to create as much good karma as possible while we have the chance. We should take every opportunity to create even the tiniest merit. Since we want even the smallest comfort, we have to create its cause. Similarly, since we don't want to experience even the smallest sufferings or inconvenience, we have to avoid creating even the tiniest non-virtue. As it says in the Vinaya teaching, Dua Lung, small drops fill a big pot. Therefore, we shouldn't think that small merits are useless. Try to collect as many as possible. It also says, a tiny spark can ignite a huge forest. Therefore, don't think that small negative karmas won't bring results. Avoid them too. Here is where we must direct all our effort. This is the Buddha's fundamental advice. And then turn to the bottom of page 70. Lama Zopa Rinpoche continues, How things exist. Now I'm going to elaborate a little on the subject of emptiness. The way in which everything exists is by being merely labeled by the mind. But that does not mean that everything the mind labels actually exists. Even though everything exists by being merely labeled by the mind, that doesn't mean that if your mind labels something, it automatically brings it into existence. For example, say I cut up a huge pile of newspapers into little pieces and my mind labels each one a billion dollars. That doesn't make each piece of paper worth a billion dollars. Even though my mind has merely labeled those pieces of paper a billion dollars, that doesn't mean each one has become a billion dollars. If it were possible for that to happen, we wouldn't have to vote in presidential elections, we wouldn't have to put all that effort into raising funds, campaigning, spending all that money, holding inquiries to elect the president. All you'd have to do would be to label yourself, I'm the American president, and you become president. 
If things coming into existence were only up to the mind labeling them, if that's all it took, then that's what would happen. Whenever you wanted to be president, all you'd have to do would be to have your mind label yourself president and you'd be president. In that way, everybody could become president. Maybe there'd be nobody left who wasn't president. A magician could hypnotize you into believing that he'd given you a bag full of money and you might carry it home believing you were rich. But later, when you opened it up, there'd be nothing there but cut up pieces of newspaper. That's one way of showing that it doesn't exist. For your own mind to discover that it's not true. Later, when you're not under the influence of hypnosis, you realize that it was an illusion. That the money you saw didn't exist. Everything was there for your mind. The appearance of money and your mind labeling it money, but it wasn't money. Another way of showing that it does not exist is for other people not to see the money. Because of the illusion created by hypnosis, money appears to your mind, but other people, whose minds are not under the illusion, don't see it. Therefore, it takes more than appearance and labeling by the mind for something to exist. Dreams are another example of something where your own mind can discover that appearance and labeling by mind are insufficient to bring something into existence. For instance, one night you might have a dream in which you became king, got married in a huge wedding ceremony, lived in a luxurious jeweled palace, and had many children. While you are dreaming, the appearance of all this and your mind labeling it are both there, but when you wake up again, you realize it wasn't true. You're not king. There's no palace, no wealth, no princes and princesses, nothing. You don't have any of that. For things to exist, mere labeling by the mind is not enough. There has to be a valid base. Not just any base, a valid base. Therefore, I cannot label my bell car. This object can receive the label bell, but not car or airplane. It receives the label bell by virtue of the way the valid base functions. Mere labeling by mind is not enough. There has to be a valid base. In the case of a bell, the base has to have a certain shape and perform the function of ringing. This is what validates it. Furthermore, the valid base that is merely labeled bell by the mind should not be harmed by another's valid mind. What's a valid mind? A mind that perceives things correctly, that is not under the influence of disease, drugs, mantras, or hypnotic spells, which might cause it to see the sense objects in an illusory way. So a mind that's not under the influence of believing wrong conventional truth or things that are unreal. Next, the object we claim to exist should not be harmed by a fully enlightened being's mind. A Buddha's mind is completely unmistaken, completely purified, free from hallucination. All existent phenomena are the object of the omniscient mind. It sees whatever exists. If the omniscient mind does not see the bell, the bell does not exist. Finally, for the mind that is merely labeled by the mind to exist, it should not receive harm from the wisdom realizing emptiness, ultimate nature. If the bell, which is merely imputed by the mind, is harmed by the wisdom realizing emptiness, it does not exist. Thus, there are three kinds of mind that can harm or invalidate the existence of what appears to be, for example, a bell. Another person's valid conventional mind, an omniscient mind, and the wisdom realizing emptiness. Those three are the criteria for a valid base, a basis on which we can merely label.
Now, regarding this valid base, this phenomena that has the function of ringing and possesses this particular shape, our mind creates the label bell. This then is the real bell, the bell that we use, the one that is merely imputed by our mind, the valid base that is labeled bell by our mind. So what is the bell that does not exist? When your mind perceives the bell, it does not see a bell that is merely labeled by the mind. It sees something slightly beyond that, ever so slightly more than that. It sees something as existing from the side of the bell, something existing from its own side, from the side of the object. If you concentrate, if you analyze carefully how the bell exists, that it is merely labeled by the mind, you can see that there's nothing coming from the side of the bell. When you look deeply into the meaning of merely labeled by the mind, you can see that nothing exists from the side of the object. When you concentrate on this, you can see how its existence comes only from your mind. But the way the bell appears to us, the way we believe it exists, is slightly beyond its reality slightly more than its actual mode of existence, which is being merely labeled by the mind. That's where the hallucination begins. Starting from there, the rest of the way it appears is a total hallucination. The way it appears, the way we believe it to exist, as something slightly beyond that which is merely labeled by the mind, is our biggest hallucination, the biggest suffering in the lives of us sentient beings. That's what keeps us continually circling in samsara, dying and being reborn, dying and being reborn, experiencing the same beginningless problems again and again. There's no beginning to our experience of samsaric suffering, and so far it has not ended. Why do we still suffer? Because we have not yet realized emptiness, the ultimate nature of phenomena that things are empty, that things exist merely in name. We have not discovered reality. We have not discovered the wisdom that cuts the root of all delusion and karma, the true cause of suffering, the cause of samsara. We have not eradicated ignorance, the unknowing mind. We have continually been creating ignorance, the root of samsara. Instead of meditating on emptiness, Practicing mindfulness, we have been making our mind more and more ignorant. That's why we continue to suffer. So what is this bell, or any other object you care to look at? It is nothing other than that which is merely labeled by the mind. But our minds are so replete with negative imprints left by past ignorance the simultaneously born concept of inherent existence, that even though things exist as merely labeled by the mind, we hold on to them as if they exist from their own side. We apprehend them as inherently existent, as not merely imputed by the mind. Therefore, this bell is merely labeled by the mind, but because of the negative imprints left on our mental continuum by past ignorance, the concept of inherent existence, the apprehension and belief that phenomena exist from their own side, as soon as our mind creates the label bell, as soon as it merely imputes bell on the base, the negative imprints left on our mental continuum project the hallucination that it exists from its own side. It's like when you take a roll of film to be developed, the images from the negative are projected onto special paper, mixed with chemicals, and a picture appears to make the photograph. Or like putting a film into a projector and beaming the images it contains onto a screen. Whatever the object, a bell, your eye, the moment it's labeled by the mind, the negative imprints project upon it the adornment of inherent existence.
The thing is that we're unaware, or we forget, that what we're seeing is merely imputed by our mind. Basically, there are three things in the evolution of all this. First of all, as a start, our mind merely labels the object. Second, the negative imprints left by previous concepts of inherent existence project the appearance of inherent existence that the object we're looking at now exists from its own side, that there's a real bell there, not a bell from our mind, but a bell from the side of the bell. This is totally, totally wrong idea. A complete hallucination projected onto the bell. Third, we allow our mind to believe that this is 100% true. We allow our mind to hold on to this, to grasp this as completely 100% true, that there's a real bell over there, that that's the reality. So the mind merely labels? Our imprints from ignorance add to what was merely labeled, the impression that what we label is more than merely labeled. That appearance of inherence is believed in. So first there's the label, then there's the addition from ignorance, then there's the belief in it all from ignorance. This is ignorance. At that moment, we are making our mind ignorant, unknowing. We are making our mind ignorant as to the actual nature of the bell, which in reality is totally empty from its own side. What exists is merely labeled by the mind. The bell, which is totally empty from its own side, exists merely in name. Being unaware of this is an example of how we make our mind ignorant. And you can continue to read this section after class if you like. So let's review this section one more time. What is it then? that causes us to label things positive or negative. What's the force behind all this? It's karma. Because of past karma, some people are able to label things positively, while others have to label them negatively. The underlying cause is karma. Therefore, you can see how crucial it is to purify past negative karma and not to create any more. In other words, how essential it is to practice dharma. So I hope that's becoming more clear. We can talk about it more on Monday. Have a little think about what is this whole premise of labeling and how does it bring things into existence in a valid way. And see you next time.